Good evening. I'm happy to welcome you to another one of our midweek Bible studies. We're continuing our study of the book of Genesis this evening. Uh, in the verses immediately following the conclusion of our lesson last week that ended in Genesis 35:15, we read in verses 16 through 20 of that same chapter of the death of Rachel as she was giving birth to her second son, Benjamin. Now, she named him Ben-Oni, uh, which means son of my sorrow, but Jacob, or Israel, named him Benjamin, meaning son of the right hand. Uh, Rachel was buried on the road to Ephrath, which is also known as Bethlehem, as they were near there when she died in childbirth. The following chapter, chapter 36, is dedicated to the story of Esau and his many descendants, uh, and it, which really confirms the fulfillment of the promise that God had made to Isaac that his son Esau would also become the father of many nations. We come this evening to uh, chapter 37, where our focal lesson begins in verse 5, but the opening verses of the chapter really set the stage for the conflict that will ensue between Joseph and his siblings. We learn in verse 2 that at the age of 17, Joseph was out tending sheep for his father along with his brothers, and he brought back a negative report to his father about his siblings who were the sons of the maids of Leah and Rachel. Uh, and that certainly wouldn't have endeared him to them as they learned of that story. Uh, we read in verse 3 of the same favoritism that had been shown in the previous two generations by his grandparents and his parents being continued. Uh, and this is a, something that's ongoing in, in this family uh, because Jacob obviously uh, favors uh, Joseph the, the at this point. Uh, the next to youngest son, Benjamin, has been born, but Joseph is, is the apple of his eye. Uh, just as Abraham had favored Isaac and Isaac had favored Esau while Rebekah favored Jacob, uh, Jacob shows this preference for Joseph over his older brothers. And as a sign of his privileged status in the eyes of his father, Israel made him what has been called alternatively a tunic, a robe, or a coat of many colors. Some versions actually refer to it as a long sleeve garment, but most translations describe it, the variety of its colors. Not surprisingly, the favoritism that Israel shows toward Joseph is a source of much bitterness and resentment, as we discover in verse 4. The verse goes on to say as much as, the, as it describes their attitude toward him as being one of hatred. It also adds that they were utterly incapable of saying anything pleasant to him. There, there were no friendly conversations, no brother-to-brother -brother chats between Joseph and his older brothers. Now, we've also spoken recently about the role of dreams as a tool that God at times chooses to use to reveal truths to people or to warn individuals of something that is coming. Uh, we noted in Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5, that dreams were to be tested in the same way that the words of a prophet were to be examined to see if they came true or not. Not every dream that a person had or chose to share was necessarily a message from the Lord. Well, we read in verse 5 that Joseph had a dream, and we learn that he shared it with his brothers, and when he did so, their hatred for him grew even stronger. Now, Moses is generally regarded as the author of Genesis, and he tells us the outcome of the telling of the dream before he goes on to describe Joseph's relating the story of his dream to his brothers. That recounting of the story takes place in the following two verses, in verses 6 and 7, with Joseph first inviting them to listen as he shares the details of his dream with them. The contents of the dream are revealed in verse 7 where he says that he and his brothers were all together in the field binding sheaves together when Joseph's sheaf stood up erect and all of the brothers' sheaves bowed down before his. That, that form of the Hebrew word translated as bow, bowing down here indicates an attitude of reverence or respect or even worship. Now sheaves, of course, were stalks or ears of cereal grains that were often bound together and stored before they were used to feed livestock. Some believe that this dream, in one sense, anticipates Pharaoh's later dreams about the heads of grain that, jo that Joseph will interpret it for, for his dream in, uh, in Genesis chapter 41, verses 22 to 24. The dream has also been suggested to be a foreshadowing of Joseph's wisdom when it came to overseeing the ingathering of the seven years of abundant harvest in Egypt prior to the seven years of famine. Now, we've also already been alerted to the outcome of the sharing of this dream by Joseph, but the brother's response is spelled out for us in verse 8. They demanded to know if he's intent on reigning or ruling over them, as the dream would suggest. Their attitude toward him intensifies, as we discover 
in the last sentence of that verse, which says, So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. At this point, our, our focal lesson jumps ahead to verse 18, but let's look at the second dream that Joseph experienced and relates to, him, to them as well that's found in verse 9. This time, Joseph tells his brother that the sun, the moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to him. This is the second dream. Verse 10 adds that he shared this dream as well, not only with his brothers, but with his father, Israel. And his father was evidently taken back by this dream uh, being shared, and he interprets it as meaning that Joseph is, assert, is asserting that he and his wife and 11 sons will all come and bow down before Joseph. Well, hearing this second dream told, the older brother's reaction this time is described as one of jealousy. That likely arises, obviously, from the favoritism that Israel or Jacob has shown toward Joseph, but maybe it also stems from the fact that they're not experiencing similar dreams. We don't know what prompts the word jealousy to be uh, described them here. And while Israel has verbally challenged Joseph about this second dream, verse 11 does tell us that he, that he kept, kept the saying in mind. Other translations suggest he kept pondering the meaning of the dream. I hear that statement, read that statement, and I think about the statements made in Luke's gospel, in Luke chapter 2, 19 and verse, and verse 51 as well, when Mary, the mother of Jesus, guarded or treasured the sayings of the angel, first of all, and later of Jesus himself in her heart. Uh, so that pondering uh, makes us think that Jacob is, is considering uh, deeply the meaning of this dream. Sometime later, Joseph's older brothers were tending the flocks of their father near Shechem in Israel. The father requests that Joseph pay them a visit there to check on the well, their well-being as well as that of the, the herds. And he's then to return and bring back a report about how things are going with them. Well, Joseph made his way to Shechem, and he didn't find his brothers nor the flock there. And so he asked a man uh, who who he happened to see happened to see wandering through the fields there about their whereabouts. And the man informed him that he had they had moved on to Dothan. So uh, Joseph makes his way there. That's the story that's found in verses 14 through 17. Our focal lesson resumes with verse 18 with the statement that the brothers spotted Joseph at a distance as he was walking toward them. Wearing that multicolored tunic that Israel had given him likely explains why they were able to recognize him at a considerable distance. He was far enough away from them at that time to, to give them time to hatch a plot to kill him, as the verse goes on to indicate. The verb translated plotted, as, as in plotted his death, and appears only four times in the Old Testament, and each occurrence carries with it the idea of acting deceitfully. Uh, the word appears in the form of a noun in Malachi 1.14 to describe the cheater, deceiver, or swindler who pledges to sacrifice a valuable male animal for his flock to the Lord, but then substitutes a defective animal in its place. Well, as the brothers plot against Joseph, they label him in verse 19 as he's approaching. They refer to him as this dreamer, the dream master or dream expert. That's clear as they're plotting to kill Joseph. They don't want his dreams to come to fulfillment. They're jealous of him and they aren't about to willingly bow down before him as the dreams have suggested that they will do one day. And the surest way to short circuit the predicted dreams from happening is to kill the dreamer. And that's exactly what they're intent on doing. Their plan is revealed in verse 20, where they voice their intention of killing him and tossing him into one of their nearby pits that are, is in that area. And later they'll explain to their father that a wild animal has eaten him. That word that's translated pits can also be translated as cistern or well. And in this arid region, wells would often frequently be dug to capture water uh, when it rained. Uh, we'll discover later in verse 24 that the pit that they chose uh, on this occasion to throw Joseph into was dry. At times, these cisterns or wells would be lined with plaster to help keep the water in because uh, the porous limestone walls of these uh, wells would often leak. Uh, this one had either let, leaked out all of its contents or it hadn't rained in a while, but it was a dry well. At this point, the oldest brother, Reuben, intervenes and rescues Joseph from their plan to kill him, the, or proposes doing so at least. The, the word translate rescue can also mean to deliver or save. It's a word that David uh, frequently employs in the Psalms as he asks God to deliver him and save him from his enemies and other occasions to deliver him from the consequences of his own sinful actions. 
We read in verses 21 and 22 that Reuben urged them not to take his life nor shed his blood. He suggested and said that they simply toss him into one of the pits. And uh, Moses, the writer, informs us of his plan to later return and rescue him from the pit and return him to his father. Uh, we see, at least in this, a measure of the compassion of Reuben in his actions in this proposal. But like many other Old Testament figures, Reuben was a mixture of positive and negative qualities. His desire to spare his brother Joseph was commendable, but earlier on, he had actually engaged in sexual relationships with one of his father's concubines. We read of that in Genesis 35, 22. And at the time that Jacob or Israel is at the point of death, he's on his deathbed basically, and he's speaking prophetic words over each of his sons and indicating what's going to happen to them. In Genesis 49, one through four, he rebukes Reuben for this action of, of sleeping with one of his concubines. Well, Joseph will also later be mo moved emotionally when he learns of Reuben's efforts to spare his life when the brothers appear before him in Egypt, when they don't recognize him as there. He's there as essentially the prime minister. You can read about that in Genesis 42, verses 21 to 24. Well, in verses 23 or 24 of our text this evening, uh, Joseph finally arrives where they are. And when he does, his brothers strip him of the multicolored tunic or the long sleeve robe, which symbolized their father's favoritism toward him. And they tossed him into this dry pit. We can only speculate as to whether they would have thrown him in it if it was full of water or not. I suspect that they would have, unless Reuben had intervened to prevent them from doing so. With Joseph in the bottom of this pit, verse 25 says the brothers sat down to eat a meal. It's really hard to conceive of a more callous attitude toward their younger brother. He's, he's traveled considerable distance to get to where they are at the request of his father to check on them and now they calmly sit down to eat a meal with no concern whatsoever about his well-being. And I guess if they've already determined that he ought to die so his dreams aren't realized, uh, there's not much sense in sharing any food with him. Uh, the Lifeway lesson writer points to the irony, though, of the brother's decision not to share any food with him, while, Jace, while Joseph himself will later be the one who provides food for the entire region around Egypt, including his own family, as they come seeking famine. Uh, seeking food, that is, during uh, the famine time. Well, as they're eating this meal, uh, a caravan of traders approaches them. They're described here as Ishmaelites, indicating that they are descendants of Abraham's son, Ishmael, uh, the son of Sarah's Egyptian maid, Hagar. That term was used to describe nomadic groups of people who wandered throughout northern Arabia. We noted last week as well that Canaan was on a well-traveled trade route that connected Asia and northern Africa. And this caravan would be following that same route from the northeast to the southwest with a, a final destination of Egypt. We learn, too, that among the products that they're transporting as they journey from Gilead, which is the name given to the Transjordanian highlands that were, would be found in modern-day Jordan, among their, their goods are aromatic gum, balm, and myrrh. <laughs> I read about, I think about balm, and I, I, it comes to mind one of the old hymns that I learned to sing as a child that was based on an African-American spiritual. It was entitled, There is a Balm in Gilead. Maybe you remember that hymn as well. This balm, it was an aromatic and medicinal ointment that was derived from the resin of balsam trees that grew in this region of Gilead. Well, in the absence of Reuben, who we later discover in verse 29, hasn't been present with the older brothers after urging that Joseph's life be spared, Judah speaks up in verse 26 and suggests that merely killing Joseph and covering up his death really won't be that profitable for them. Instead, he suggests in verse 27 that they sell him to these traders. And he actually goes on to voice a concern that he is, after all, their brother in their own flesh. And he seems maybe to have been at least convinced by Reuben's early uh, uh, earlier appeal to spare Joseph's life. Well, the, pro, the proposal of Judas seems good to his brothers, and they proceed to the transaction. Now, the wording of verse 28 is a bit confusing because it sounds initially like a separate group of traders comes by, because this time they're referred to as Midianites. The, the word Midianite itself means strife, and the name comes from the son of Abraham, Midian, by Keturah, who was a, one of the wives that he married after Sarah's death. Abraham sent Midian and his brothers to the east, and so that would make sense that they're coming from that direction as well. 
Moses also would later flee there after killing the Egyptian, and he married a daughter of the priest of Midian. We read that in Exodus chapter 2, verses 15 through 16 and verse 21. Now, the Midianites would also later repeatedly attack Israel during the period of the judges until God raised up Gideon as their deliverer to defeat them. And you can read about that account in Judges chapters 6 through 8. The continuation of verse 28 says that the brothers sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites, indicating that these indeed were the same traders who are also called Midianites earlier in the same verse. The price for Joseph was 20 shekels of silver. The typical price for a slave in those days we read was, uh, we understand was 30 shekels, but some scholars suggest that 20 was the fair price for a younger man. Uh, While our lesson concludes with verse 28, permit me to wrap up the story. We read that Reuben returns to the pit in verse 29, indicating obviously that he's been gone. Uh, His absence isn't explained, but he comes back and discovers the pit to be empty. So it's clear he wasn't part of the deliberations about selling Joseph to the traders. And in his anguish, he tears his garments, which is always a sign that communicates deep distress. And he basically asks them yet next a question, what am I going to do now? Where can I go? What what can I do in the light of the, the fact that our brother is gone? And the brothers respond by slaughtering a male goat and dipping Joseph's tunic in it. They then proceed to return to to Jacob or Israel taking his blood-stained robe with them, and and they utter a bald-faced lie to their dad, saying, we found this tunic, we found this robe covered in blood. Then they ask their father to examine it to see if it's Joseph's or not. And he jumps to the, well, first he confirms that it is indeed the tunic that he has gifted to the son, but then he jumps to the conclusion that they had originally proposed that they were going to offer to him as an explanation for the blood on the garment that a wild animal has killed and eaten Joseph. So he assumes that this is what has happened. And they're perfectly fine with this this assumption as it doesn't reveal their own scheming and their plot to get rid of Joseph by initially killing him was the thought, but then later uh, resolving just to sell him into slavery in Egypt. Jacob does what Reuben has already done at the news is he also tears his garment and takes the additional step of putting on sackcloth. This is also a, a common sign of mourning as he, he's, he mourns Joseph's presumed death and every effort that the children make to console him, which in, in itself is another act in deception as they clearly know he's still alive. Those efforts prove fruitless because jo- Jacob weeps inconsolably for his son Joseph and he expresses his con- his conviction in the final verses of this chapter that he will die and descend into Sheol, the place of the dead, still mourning the loss of his favorite son. Uh, the story of Joseph is an, is a, an amazing and incredible story of God's care and God's provision for his people. And we'll see that in coming weeks as well, how that fleshes out as as God uses Joseph in miraculous and powerful ways, and even in the face of some accusations that are made against him unjustly. So I invite you to pray with me as we wrap up our study this evening. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for how we find instruction, truth in it. Every time we open its pages, we find encouragement and words that point out to us your faithfulness in dealing with your people in the past and and the promise that you continue to do so in the present. Thank you, Father, for your goodness and your mercy and grace toward each and every one of us. I thank you as well for the visit of our Cuban pastor friends this last Sunday. I continue to bless them in their extended stay here in the States in the coming weeks and give them a safe return to their families there in Cuba. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you this coming Sunday. As a reminder, we'll not have any community groups this week, but we're going to have an extended time in worship as we dedicate our newly renovated facility to the Lord. And we'll have a time of fellowship and some refreshments afterwards. God bless you. Hope to see you this coming Sunday. Bye for now.